All right, hopefully this will go okay. I've, I've got to confess, I'm someone who thinks a creative morning is a contradiction in terms, so uh, it's a little bit too early for my brain to be firing today, so hopefully this will be okay. Um, but Jeremy's very convincing and managed to convince me to come along despite my overwhelming desire to sleep in. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, this, this idea of creating cities. And um, this, the framework I'm going to talk about today is the Renew Newcastle project that we've been working on in Newcastle for the last few years. But I'm trying to sort of zoom out from that or zoom into that and kind of look around at some of the bigger ideas about how cities work that are kind of obsessing me at the moment. And the particular idea that I'm, I'm really trying to kind of explore today is this idea of looking at cities and urbanism and communities from the bottom up and not the top down. So I think one of the problems that we tend to make most of the time, sometimes call it the sim city problem, where we sort of think when we're designing cities that we're trying to design big blocks and move them around and we need mega structures and giant galleries and big museums and massive huge projects and that cities are the construction of big fixed infrastructure elements. And my argument, which hopefully will be um, convincing today, is that um, that's almost the wrong, completely wrong way to look at what a city is. To me, a city is a set of opportunities and possibilities. It's about relationships between people who want to do things and try things and how easy it is or not easy it is for them to do things and try things. So I want to go back to where um, I really started thinking about this. As Jeremy said, my background was not as an urbanist or a city person or, a, or whatever. My, my background was as a festival director. I started a festival in Newcastle 10, 15 years ago called This Is Not Art. I moved to Melbourne to take on the role of the director of the Next Wave Festival here. And um, I didn't really think about cities very much except as a user of them, someone who wanted to put on events or try things or do things. I've never studied architecture. I've never studied design. I've never studied urban planning. Um, I've actually never completed a degree at all. I got kicked out of uni about three times. Um, but my interest was really in looking at the city from the point of view of people who wanted to do stuff. And it was particularly acutely sort of um, framed by going back to my hometown of Newcastle after living in Melbourne for about five or six years and just looking at the way the city was decaying. And these are all photos from 2008. You can see all these vacant buildings. That's um, second oldest theatre in Australia. It's been empty all my life. Um, empty for lease it up. Um, it's Newcastle's post office. It's been empty for about 10 or 12 years. Um, I don't know what that used to be, but it's not there anymore. Um, I, always, I like this one. It's sort of like if you ever need to want to do a post-apocalyptic zombie movie, <laughs> Newcastle's an excellent place to get really cheap sets. You know, the Chico roll sign and the spring roll signs and the milkshake signs are all still up, but no one's been there in about 10 years. Um, this is boarded up. That's boarded up. That entire block has been gutted and more or less set on fire. All up, um, in 2008, I just kind of walked along the two main streets of my hometown and just counted all the empty buildings. And uh, I later came back and sort of plotted, wrote them all down and plotted them on a map. And all up, there was about 150 empty buildings on the two main streets. All of those red dots were empty spaces. And so what was interesting about this wasn't just the fact that these spaces were empty. It was, the, it was actually part of the reason why I started looking at all these spaces that I had an idea. Back in 2008, I actually wanted to start a little bar in Newcastle. They just changed the liquor licensing laws in New South Wales. I thought, this could be, you know, a good chance. I might go and try and start a bar in Newcastle. There's heaps of empty space there. I should be able to get something cheap. And I contacted about 12 or 15 real estate agents and actually none of them ever got back to me. I thought, this is a bit weird. Like, why, why is this? And very long story, but a lot of thinking about the problem really made me realise that whilst there was a huge amount of space in Newcastle that was empty, there wasn't a lot of space in Newcastle that was actually accessible to people like me if they wanted to do something. And I was probably in a better position than most to do something. So I think the problem with cities is this, this kind of dynamic about um, cities are designed for capital. They're designed for people that have got money and they're designed to allow people that have got money to do things and the, usually the price to entry in a city is capital. It's that you need to have... Um, a, a, a big bank loan, you need to be able to sign a five-year lease, you need to be able to have access to, a lot of the time, I sometimes say we've professionalised participation. You need to have access to expertise, you need to have lawyers, you need to have people who can tell you how to do development permits and, and things like that. And the reality is that whilst I knew a lot of people in Newcastle who wanted to do stuff, none of them had access to that stuff. So, um, and, and this, the other challenge, I think, is with a city like Newcastle, it's been in such a bad way for such a long time, there's what I call the, the kind of the big idea problem. Everyone is waiting for someone else to do something first in order to fix the city. So, whether it's a mega shopping centre, retail development in the centre of the city, or there's a rail line that runs up the centre of the city and there's been a 25-year debate about whether it should come or go. All of these are legitimate questions, but the problem is that everyone's sort of looking at it, again, from this sort of top-down, big-picture point of view, and they're not asking the really basic questions of, how do we get people who want to do things in the city now to do them? 
Um, as I said, my background was as a festival director, so I used to run the This Is Not Art Festival in Newcastle, and I guess what I've been really interested in more generally recently is this uptick in lo-fi, small-scale creative participation. So um, this is an old search from Flickr. I found 482 groups tagged as Newcastle Australia on Flickr. So lots of photographers out there taking photographs. Um, some of them are really classy, like Newey girls. <laughs> some of them are a bit... Uh, Newcastle Harbour Facilities, that's a specialist interest, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Storm and Lightning Group, okay. Um, but some little great projects like this, 10, 10, 10. So just people who spontaneously organise in the local community to take photos on the 10th of the 10th, 2010, and document them together. So lots of little of these creative things that are happening out there. Um, Etsy is another one of my favourite sort of things to look at, I think, as a phenomenon. So um, if you look at... Uh, this, is, this is an old search from Newcastle, found 700 items, about 40 sellers in, on Etsy in Newcastle. This is a more recent search. That number's actually tripled in the course of about 18 months between those two searches. Um, a really interesting factoid, um, which I found from the head of Etsy when it came out to Australia last year, is that 70% of Australian Etsy sales are international exports which means there's lots of people in communities like Newcastle doing stuff and selling it all around the world, but you can't see them in Newcastle. Like, there's no physical evidence or presence that they're actually there. What had interested me in my life as a festival director, I was writing a column for The Age, and I, was, um, I did write a cut and presented a couple of TV series on the ABC. Um, I was really interested in this, in this incredible phenomenon of small-scale creative participation growing. And in the seven, six years up to when we started Renew Newcastle, it's my little favourite example. There was a 671% increase in the number of jewellers working professionally or semi-professionally in Australia. And that's the, that's the flip side of that Etsy effect. There's lots of people working. Um, they're selling things through design markets. They've got lots of um, opportunities. They may only be doing $1,000, $2,000 worth of business a year, but they're out there and they're doing stuff. You can't see them in their local communities. And the traditional proposition about getting them into a retail space doesn't really make sense. You know, they're not going to go and take a five-year... Um, lease. They're not going to go and borrow $100,000. They're not going to go and um, take up opportunities on that scale because it doesn't make sense for them. The reason they're doing what they're doing is because the barriers to entry have been really low and allowed them to get started easily. If you want them to, to progress from there to doing something in the real world, you need to provide them with low barriers to entry to allow them to do that. Um, the other thing that's going on in the world that interests me a lot is you're, looking, you're seeing the, um, the sort of end of retail as we knew it. So for such a long time, you know, we just built retail, more and more and more and more of it, because, you know, that was the logic of how we organised our cities. And what's happening at the moment, I, I don't know if anyone's seen deadmalls.com, it's a fantastic ruin porn website of dead shopping centres all around the world. Um, but the reality is that, um, I, you know, iTunes, Amazon, um, you're, you're witnessing this incredible transformation of retail that's kind of taking the logic out of the way in which we designed and ran places for such a long time. Poor Jerry Harvey's complaining that he can't make money anymore. Um, in the UK and the US, it's even worse. So the same term keeps turning up, ghost towns. Malls are turning into ghost towns. Um, in the UK, 208 companies operating 21,000 stores employing 187,000 people went broke between 2007 and 2012. In Australia, you've, we've witnessed some of that. We haven't had the same depth of recession, but everywhere I'm talking to people that are in retail, go and have a look at Bridge Road, go and have a look at Newcastle, go and have a look at anywhere there's a main street. Most, even most shopping centres have had to dramatically cut their... Uh, even if they look full, they're not making anywhere near the money they were making a few years ago because that whole um, logic has been upended by things moving online. So on one, line, on one side, you've got two things happening. You've got this incredible upsurge of people doing stuff in their bedrooms and spare rooms and garages and selling it all around the world. That's one flip side of the internet phenomenon. And the other side, you've got this kind of logic of how we used to just sell junk from China on shops in markups on main streets and make money out of it. Um, that's kind of falling apart because you can get junk from China cheaper on the internet now. So I, sometimes, like, sorry, I, you're probably all graphic designers. I mocked this up last night. It's pretty shit. Um, <laughs> But there's a long tail of city makers. So the reality at the moment is that you've got... Um, cities are designed for people with capital. They're designed for that, like, top 10% of people who want to do stuff. The question I was kind of theoretically asking myself was, what happens if you move that slider along to there? What happens if you allow, um, rather than 10% of people in a city to try things and start things and do things, what happens if you allow 60%, 80%, 100%, or at least 20 30%? So... 
um, a, lot of, a lot of my thinking now is about this idea of an iterative city. So rather than this idea of the big picture, we're going to, you know, we're going to decide what happens and build it and spend a lot of capital on it and we're going to build everything into a financial formula. The way I think about cities and what we've tried to do with Renew Newcastle is what happens if we do the reverse? What happens if we just, if we admit that we don't know what we're doing and we just try lots of stuff? We encourage lots of people to try lots of things and we embrace the idea of an open-ended experiment. What should theoretically happen out of that process is that after a few years, you start to accumulate what works. What's left behind is what works. So we started working with Renew Newcastle in 2008. 2008, um, we started with this process. We signed a bunch of legal paperwork. We incorporated a not-for-profit company called Renew Newcastle. And what Renew Newcastle is set up to do is borrow buildings from their owners while they're empty and lend them to people who want to start stuff. And I could talk for hours about the very boring process natures of how that works, but a lot of what we do is based on the premise that we're using buildings on a rolling short-term basis, so if the owner gets a better offer, they can have their building back. In the interim, they give it to us for free, and we give it to someone else for basically nothing. Um, we give someone a chance to start something. We manage, or we try to manage as much as possible, all of those complexities, like the DAs and the permit processes and the, um, you know, the insurance, the public liability, all of that sort of stuff. So what we're doing is, is creating a system that lowers the barrier so that lots and lots and lots of new people can try things that weren't able to try them before. By early 2009, we'd started moving people into spaces. Um, these are some of the same spaces I showed you before. People were getting in there, they were cleaning them up, they were fixing them up, they were using their own energy, and people were trying all sorts of stuff. This is a sound art gallery, the only dedicated sound art gallery in all of Australia, ran for a couple of years on the mall in Newcastle. Fair to say that's a niche interest and didn't find a commercial market in the long term, but it was a great experiment. Um, going back to the Flickr thing, this is a photography gallery really supporting those kind of photographers, you know, the people who, were, who aren't quite professional enough to have their own galleries but, you know, are making really good stuff and wanting an opportunity to exhibit it. They had group shows where they had 800 people lining up to get into the opening nights because a huge cross-section of the community were involved in exhibiting their work there. Um, this is a um, contemporary art gallery in what was a bare concrete shell. So we just, we just worked with the fact it was a bare concrete shell. We didn't try to do too much in terms of fit out or cost. Um, and so, but what that allowed was someone to put in uh, an exhibition where they covered the walls with latex, as you do, um, and invited the public to rip it off, which was, um, I guess, like one of the most therapeutic exhibitions I've ever been to. It's really, really quite enjoyable. Um, and then you had other examples of this. Like, this is your classic kind of, you know, Etsy, um, kind of outcome. So these are all young mums who make kids' clothes, bags, jewellery. They, they, they've come together. Um, there are initially five of them. I think there's about 30 involved now. We've moved this project about four times in different spaces. Um, they, uh, uh, they'd all been making stuff and selling it online or selling it through design markets or, or, or finding audiences in, in, um, out there in other kinds of ways. Um, they were able to, between the five of them, staff a shop and, and um, take it over. They probably couldn't have in their right minds ever have taken a five-year lease to get a project going, but wherever we've put them, lots of people have gone there because people are interested in what they're doing and they've, um, it's made a big difference. So come to 2010, um, these projects are all up and running. We've got an Indigenous art gallery, we've got a zine store, milliners, an upcycled design store, uh, artist-run gallery and studio complex. Um, by 2011, we've got record labels, uh, arts, crafts, design spaces for, for people to do crafts and, and sell local arts and crafts. Um, make space, the one I showed you before, has moved a couple of times. Uh, this, is a, this is an old ophthalmologist surgery that's been converted into a uh, workspace for little one and two person based like laptop businesses, so designers, um, online publishers, people like that. Uh, this is a co-working space. This is an interesting example of our philosophy of just like using, doing what you can with the buildings that you've got. So I showed you the example before of the um, the artist-run gallery, uh, the, the gallery exhibition space in the in the bare concrete shell. This is the other end of the spectrum. The owner said, "Look, it's it's grade A office. I've just spent all this money on it. You can have it, but you can't put a nail in the wall." So everything in that, uh, no hippies, basically. Uh, they literally said no hippies. Um, um, this is all done on trestle tables. Everything in that picture can be just picked up and moved, and it's designed to be able to be moved, and we've moved it three or four times. Um, they've now found a more permanent home. Um, another um, design studio. Uh, by 2012, a, a real transformation was starting to take place. So you could see, um, this is the old David Jones in Newcastle. We've taken the front of it, we've put in all local fashion designers, um, taken this entire city block that's been dead and brought it back to life by um, giving local designers, uh, particularly fashion designers, a chance to set up their own spaces and stores. 
By 2013, the area had changed dramatically. This is the same place I was showing you in the pictures at the beginning. Um, where there had once been empty shops, there's suddenly cafes, restaurants, new traders opened up. Um, we've taken uh, this derelict former bar, it's now functioning as a small venue. I, didn't, I never did get to start my bar, but someone else did, so that's all right. Um, this is the old David Jones, suddenly back to life again. People there. The city has just completely changed. Um, uh, Shannon Hardigan, who's a photographer, we'd lent him a building in a um, right, the wrong end of an arcade. In, there was a bad 80s arcade in Newcastle. He has bought this building to move his business into um, after getting a toehold in a, on a rolling 30-day basis on a really Newcastle space. This is, a, um, this is a jeweler that's now a full commercial tenant in the city. Again, example of that sort of Etsy stuff going back to that, that, that uptick in jewellers. Like, there's, there's half a dozen local jewellers who are... Uh, come together to set up this space, it's now a commercial concern and they're running classes for other people who want to do jewellery. Um, all up, Renew Newcastle, we've done 120 projects in 50, I think it's 54 or 55 buildings that were once empty in the city in about four years. Um, there's been a 50 to 90% drop in the vacancy rate, 50% across the city as a whole and about 90% in some of the areas we've been working at intensively. Um, two projects have bought buildings after getting a toehold through us. Um, Lonely Planet named itself, uh, named Newcastle in 2011 one of the top ten cities to visit in the world. It was the first time any Australian city had ever made that list and they cited um, Renew Newcastle as the key reason why they had done that. Um, there's about 20 places around the world. We've just started a project in Docklands. We're up to about 10 spaces now that Renew Australia have started. There's about 20 places. There's Renew Rotterdam. There's uh, Renew Lisbon. There's Renew projects in, in two, two projects in um, Ontario, in Canada, one in Toronto, one in uh, a little town called New Um there's, uh, there's Renew Adelaide in Australia. There's projects um, and there's lots of individual uh, people that are using our basic legal template. We've, we've open sourced all the stuff that we've learned. So you can go to the Renew Australia website and you can download the licence agreement that we use. Um, and there's a guide there that's quite free if anyone wants to read it about the, um, you know, how to approach property owners and why the model works and all that sort of stuff. And we keep coming across, I literally run into people who go, oh, by the way, I downloaded that document from your website and that's how I got to access this space. Um, so the model has been really, really successful. The flip side of that is that all of that big picture stuff that was supposed to happen in Newcastle, the big development and the inner city train line stuff, none of it has still happened yet. We're still waiting. It was three to five years away back in 2008 and it's three to five years away in 2013. Um, I think one of the real dangers that you get is that um, cities tend to uh, um, defer the future. They, they, in, 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 it's not that there's anything wrong with the big picture stuff. There's nothing wrong with, um, uh, you know, doing master plans and big designs and thinking about those sort of infrastructure questions and trying to make changes on a grand scale. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But deferring the future and waiting for the big stuff to happen at the expense of accumulating all the little wins and supporting all the little stuff you can do now, to me, is a fundamental structural mistake about how people get cities wrong. So, yeah, that's, the, um, that's my, my spiel. Um, just to get a plug in, I'm, I'm, I'm crowdfunding a book um, it's called Creating Cities. Um, it's still running on Possible. I've, I've actually like tripled my target already. But if you want to get your name in the book, uh, and if you want to uh, pre-order a copy, you can do that. Um, and the Renew Australia website has links to all of those projects and has, um, as I said, we've sort of open sourced a lot of the information, the tools out there about um, how to access properties and run these kind of projects. And there's guides on our websites about that. So um, I think I've gone a bit under time, but uh, it's the danger of talking fast. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.